Welcome back to Mr. News Art Class. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces. Today we're going to talk about six different ways that we can create a 3D space on a flat page. We're creating an illusion like we're magicians or something. We'll start with the simple stuff and work our way towards the more complex ideas, but all of this should be pretty easy to understand for today. And if you want a copy of this sheet, check the link in the description below or you can just make your own thumbnail boxes on any old paper. As we zoom in and look at these one at a time, we'll start with overlapping. To get a good feel for what overlapping looks like, let's take a look at Henry Rousseau's Tiger Riding Ukulele Man. In this picture you can clearly tell that the tiger and the man riding it are in front of the rest of the picture. I mean, there's a few little leaves that overlap in front of the tiger's foot, but everything else goes behind the tiger. There's a lot of leaves that go behind the tiger. There's a lot of branches that go behind the man. Uh, you can also see that there's a lion hiding behind some of the leaves and flowers. And then there's trees even further away. And we can tell all of this because things are stacked up one thing on top of another, covering each other up. So here I want to draw something that overlaps. It could be anything. I'm drawing a tree. You draw whatever you want. But the idea is to draw one thing that's close and then something else that's farther away. And make sure that the farther away object goes behind the closer object. So here I'm drawing a train that goes behind my tree. Notice that I have continuity between the shapes there. They, they continue going in a, in a line. Uh, it's, it's not where they're kind of offset from each other. If the tree wasn't there, then you could easily fill in that last little gap of the train. And in this case, I drew the foreground object first. I drew the tree, and then I draw things behind by bumping and jumping. So, like, I can draw the train track until I get to the tree, and then jump over the tree to keep going. Or, if I want to make another tree here, I can draw a tree right on top of something I've already drawn, and then erase what's behind it. That's the other way to overlap. And again, as I come back and draw the horizon behind, uh, I'm going to draw that with bumping and jumping. So I'm going to draw the horizon until I bump into my tree, jump over it, keep going, bump into my train, jump over it, bump into the tree, jump over it. And I'll do the same with some very distant mountains. Moving on to relative sizes, let's take a look at a painting called American Gothic by Grant Wood. Now here we've got overlapping like we just talked about, but we want to focus on relative size. So look at the window between these two farmers' heads. Notice that that window is like smaller. It's like half as big as that guy's head. Well, I've never seen a house where the windows are smaller than my head before, but it actually isn't like that. The windows are not actually smaller than his head. Why do they look smaller? They look small because they're farther away. Things that are close to us appear larger. Things that are farther away appear smaller. So here in our little thumbnail sketch we can use trees and trains or like we did before or we can do whatever else here I'm just going to make a couple of houses and the foreground house is going to be so huge that it crops off the edge of the page. Uh, all we're going to see is one window and the roof and notice that this is so big like it's bigger than the edges of the page. If you could see the whole house uh, it would go uh, it would go down off the bottom of the page and it would hang off to the left side of the page and even up over the top. And then I'll draw a second house that is uh, smaller and farther away. Notice it's, uh, it's just a simple little you know, square and triangle house like you would draw in kindergarten, but I've made it smaller, which makes it look farther away. 
And if you really want, you could make a third house that's really super tiny and even farther, farther away. And adding the horizon in the background helps to ground the picture, and why not? I'll add some tiny mountains far, far away as well. And sliding down here to take a look at placement relative to the horizon, this line right in the middle is the horizon where the sky and the land meet. Let's take a look at Camille Pissarro's Boulevard Montmartre Afternoon Sunlight to see what this is all about. Notice in this painting the horizon, you can only see a little bit of it between the buildings down at the very end of the street under the clouds. But as the horse-drawn carriages on the street get to the bottom of the page, they are further away from the horizon. That means they're closer to us, and that means they're larger. But then as you move up the page, closer to the horizon, those horse-drawn carriages get smaller, because as you get closer to the horizon, those things are farther away. So here, I'm just going to draw like a tall building, like a skyscraper or something. Notice that the bottom of the building is at the bottom of the page. The bottom, where it touches the ground, is far away from the horizon. It's down at the bottom of the page. That means this is close to us. So I'm going to see a lot of detail, uh, and it's going to be big because it's close to us. Now here, closer to the horizon, I'm drawing the bottom of a building. But going back to what we talked about before with relative sizes, it should be a lot smaller. If it's closer to the horizon, it's farther away, so it should be much smaller. Notice that it's not as low down on the paper. Notice that there's less detail because it's farther away. The same is true for clouds in the sky. Here I'm drawing a big cloud that's up high, away from the horizon. But if I was drawing a cloud closer to the horizon, then it's smaller because it's farther away. And I can also use overlapping in there and put a cloud behind this building. Now, those two buildings have a lot of space between them. One is close and one is far. If I draw a third building that is sort of in between, I can uh, you know, make it not quite as far away from the horizon, not quite as close to the horizon. So notice here, it's not as far away as that one. It's not as close to the horizon as that one. But it's also not as close to us as this big one. So it's going to be smaller than that one, bigger than that one it's kind of an in-between size. And I can even do the same thing in the sky with the clouds. I can make one that's cl uh, closer to us than that one, farther away than that one, make it in between so it's not as close or not as far. And it also overlaps. So what's close to us is far away from the horizon. And what's far away from us is close to the horizon. Make sense? Same in the sky. What's close to us is far away from the horizon, and what's far away from us is close to the horizon. As we move on to talk about level of detail, let's take a look at an illustration from the Calvin and Hobbes comics by Bill Watterson. So as we take a look at this picture, we notice that the boy and his tiger are clearly in the foreground sitting and standing on a rock. But notice the background. Notice the green and brown fuzziness behind them. Notice that there's very little detail. You can barely make out the indication that there are some branches or trees, some grassy areas, but there's no there's no detail. You can't see the bark on the trees. You can't see individual blades of grass. You can't see individual little spots of dirt or rock. Only in the foreground do you see all those details. So here on our pages, what we can do is maybe start by creating one main foreground element. I'll draw another tree, like I've done a couple here in my earlier picture. And notice that I'm going back in and adding lots of extra detail. I'm adding some roots. I'm adding some texture to the bark, uh, some 
just anything I can do to make it look most detail possible. Extra branches, maybe some extra leaves and things. And then coming into the background, instead of trying to draw a whole dark line where the horizon is, I'm just ever so faintly penciling in the basic idea where a hill is and I'm using the side of my pencil to just kind of shade in some little indications of where there might be rocks or twigs or branches or distant trees. I'm not not trying to draw any actual detail, not really getting any branches there, just the indication that there's something back there, but we can't really tell exactly what. And then I'm going to go back even into my foreground tree and just darken things up, make even higher contrast, just to make that stand out a little bit more. As we move down the page to looking at one point perspective, let's talk about Mark Crilly. Here's an illustration from his book, The Drawing Lesson. When we talk about one-point perspective, we're talking about a way of organizing all of the thoughts we've talked about before. So again here, notice that these houses get smaller as they get farther away. The road gets smaller as it gets farther away. The trees get smaller. And even the sidewalks get smaller as they get farther away. And if you look at the way the road points, notice that the two sides of the road if the boy wasn't there in the middle, the two sides of the road would converge, they would come together at a point right behind the boy. If you draw a line across the bottoms of the houses, they would also, those lines would also converge at the same point. The sidewalks would converge at the same point. A line across the tops of the houses would converge at the same point. And that one point is called a vanishing point. So here on this little thumbnail we have a basic grid, a basic perspective grid. Notice that across the middle there's a horizon and then there's also this X. And we're not going to think of it as an X, we're going to think of it as top and bottom lines. So I'm going to draw something that goes from top to bottom. Like here's a tree that goes from the bottom line up to the top line making a bunch of branches. Notice it starts at the baseline and goes up to the top line. Then I'm going to make another tree behind it and it's going to go from the baseline to the top line. It's really just another way of thinking about placement relative to the horizon. This tree is closer to the horizon so it's smaller and farther away and this tree is closer to us is farther away from the horizon. So I'm going to add a little bit of extra detail to it. And then as I move back and make another tree, again between the top and bottom lines, notice they get smaller and smaller as they get farther away. And they look like they're in a row. I'll do the same thing on this side in case you were under a rock and you missed it. Make a tall tree that goes from the baseline to the top line the foreground element. I'm going to give lots of detail. Extra branches, detail in the bark, whatever. And then the next tree behind it, again going from the top line to the bottom line. And again the next one going from the bottom line to the top line. Bottom line to top line. And in the middle here we could even make a road. It already looks like a path of some kind. I'm just going to use uh, those lines as a guide. I'm not actually going to draw the road on those lines, but a little bit in between them. So coming from that vanishing point down almost on the line, but a little bit in from the line on both sides. There's the sides of my road. And uh, to make the line between the roads, uh, between the um, lanes of the road, uh, what I want to do is make it a dash line, and the dash that's really close to me is going to be big. And then those dashes are going to get smaller, and smaller, and smaller, until they're just tiny dots as it goes farther away. And now that looks like I am right in the middle of a road that has trees on both sides with one point perspective.
Now, as we move on to aerial perspective, it's basically taking this level of detail up to the nth degree. So, let's take a look at Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise to get an idea of what this looks like. So this painting has a ton of aerial perspective. Aerial perspective is that look where everything that's far away is foggy and hard to see, and things that are closer have a little bit more contrast and a little bit more detail. Take a look at the fishing boats. Notice there's three. The first one, right in the middle at the bottom of the page, is darker, and even that one is very faint and hard to see, but the one up just to up and to the left of it is very faint and then there's a tiny little indication of another fishing boat a little farther away from that and then in the very far distance you can see a port city that's pretty much just a grayish blue blob so when we create aerial perspective in our drawings we only want to do that if we're seeing something that's got a very vast distance. For example, maybe here I will start with a mountain that's closer to us and uh, I'll darken that quite a bit. I want a lot of contrast, the darkest darks and the lightest lights up here in the foreground. So I'm darkening in shadows, assuming a light is shining on one side of the picture. Darkening the shadows on the left side and there's really no wrong way to uh, to do the shadows on mountains. I'm just looking at each little peak and seeing where's the left side of that peak. Let's make a shadow on the left side, assuming the light is shining from the right side. So here you can see between the bright whites and the dark blacks, there's a high contrast, a big difference. And as I move on to some smaller, more distant mountains, I'm going to lighten up on my pencil so I'm not pushing quite as hard. It's a little bit grayer, a little bit less dark. I'm still going to add some shadows, but they're not going to be nearly as dark. It's going to be much fainter. And with each successive layer of mountains, the more distant they are, the lighter, fainter less contrast they are so here I'm not even gonna do any highlights and shadows just that that third layer just one faint gray tone and I could even add some more that are just an even fainter gray they're just barely hinted at and even smudging them with my fingers to make them less visible these mountains in the distance fade off into the sky because there's a lot of air between them and then these ones up close are much easier to see which with higher contrast and more level of detail they just get foggier and foggier as they get further away so there you have it that's six different ways to create 3d space or the illusion of 3d space on a flat sheet of paper you notice how each method kind of adds on and plays off of each other in a lot of good ways. So go ahead and practice these and see what you can make. See what kinds of 3D spaces you can create.